homophobia and transphobia in the workplace undermine everybody's collective bargaining power. You don't have to like us, but it's actually in your own self-interest to make sure that all of your coworkers have respect, safety. We've got Brittany Anderson on the line from Pride at Work. Brittany, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So uh, you are here representing Pride at Work, and I want to talk about Pride at Work and, and the work that y'all do and what y'all are all about. Uh, but before we get into that, I was wondering if you could just introduce yourself. Tell us about who you are and your journey in the labor movement. Absolutely. Um, so thanks again for having me. So excited to be here talking to folks in Alabama and down in the South. Um, my name is Brittany Anderson. I have the pleasure of serving as national co-president of Pride at Work, which is the AFL-CIO constituency group for LGBTQ workers. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I'm just a proud union queer. Um, I grew up in rural Minnesota and was raised by a single mom. She always worked a full-time and a part-time job, and we still really struggled to get by. Um, and I myself worked at like Kmart, Shopco, a cabinet factory, and I saw most of my community struggling as well. Um, just like generations of families in my community breaking their bodies and maybe making it up to 12 or $14 an hour after a decade or two at the same place. Right. Um, and still just having very little financial security to show for all of their hard work, right? The American dream just isn't real for most folks, no matter how hard they work. Um, and so even though I love my hometown, I just didn't see a future for myself there in terms of job opportunities and because I knew deep down that I'm queer. Um, and it's a very conservative area. I graduated from high school back in 2008. Um, so I did the cliche queer kid thing and took off to college in New York City. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to be there when Occupy Wall Street started in 2011. Wow. At Occupy, I met union organizers. At that time, I didn't know what a union was, um, but they took me under their wing and helped me understand that being poor is not something to be ashamed of um, and that it's not your fault. Um, that actually Wall Street and the ultra wealthy have rigged the economy against working people. Um, and so I went on, I fell in love with the labor movement. Um, it changed everything about how I saw the world, my life, my family. Um, and I went on to work for Local 338 of the UC UFCW and RWDSU, the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union, which I know has a big presence down there. And then the International of the RWDSU. Um, I moved back to Minnesota in 2017 to work as field director for the Southeast Minnesota Area Labor Council and then for the Machinist Union. Um, and I was elected as co-president of Pride at Work in 2022. We just had uh, some workers on earlier in the show who have a union election on Wednesday um, with the Machinist Union here in Huntsville. Yeah, yeah, good good machinist representation today <laughs> on the show on the Valley Labor Report. That's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that that story and and a little bit about your journey there. Uh, you know, that's really cool that you've been able to uh, connect with different unions that way. And um, you know, I'm I'm about the same age as you. I I'm one year older than you, I think. So I I kind of developed along the same line. And Occupy Wall Street was very big in my consciousness. However, from very much afar, uh, you know, Occupy didn't make it too far in Alabama, but um, it, it, it was inspiring nonetheless. And so, yeah, that really resonates with me. So talk to me about Pride at Work. What, what do y'all do and, and why do y'all exist? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Pride at Work, we're the constituency group for the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO is the umbrella for most labor unions in the United States. Um, and so we're the constituency group for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer workers. Um, so we, we build queer and trans union power. Um, we have 29 chapters across the country and several more in early stages of organizing, um, including in some of your neighboring states there in the South. And we would love to see an Alabama chapter. 
Um, so our chapters have a lot of autonomy uh, to work on the issues that are most important to them. So it looks different across the country in a lot of cases. Um, one thing we're doing as a whole organization right now is our chapters have adopted over 75 union Starbucks locations where we provide solidarity to those local Starbucks workers, United Union siblings, um, whenever they need us. Like right now, they're going on a nationwide strike, um, which is such an exciting and powerful moment. Um, in Washington state, one of our chapters started the local pride festival because there was just nothing being done for pride. We have other ones who work on local and state legislation. So sometimes it's passing like a municipal ordinance to make sure that trans and non-binary folks um, have access to safe and comfortable bathrooms um, at the local library, for instance. Um, we also provide a lot of training and guidance to unions on how to write and enforce contract language that protects queer and trans union members and to make sure that the, uh, the union health care benefits um, cover gender affirming health care. Um, you can find lots of good information on that on our website, including model contract language. Um, but we're always happy to answer questions. We field a ton of informal phone calls from cis straight union leaders and reps who really want to do right by their LGBTQ union siblings, but just like aren't sure how to best handle a situation or what the right words are to use. So we, we love being a resource. Um, we also have a phenomenal LGBTQ plus 101 training that's geared toward, you know, union leaders, reps, stewards, anyone who wants to learn how to stand in solidarity with queer and trans coworkers. Um, we do cover topics, you know, like pronouns and bathroom access, but it's also about grounding ourselves in union values and recognizing how homophobia and transphobia in the workplace undermine everybody's collective bargaining power. Um, right. You don't have to like us or agree with everything, but it's actually in your own self-interest to make sure that all of your coworkers have respect, safety, and health care that covers all their needs. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, for me, I think the answer to bigotry is solidarity, that, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. And, you know, something I've said on the show before is like, you don't have to understand everything about other folks. You don't have to know everything, uh, you know, about gender theory or queer theory. Like, you don't have to be an expert in all that to know everybody should be treated respectfully and be treated with dignity. And everyone deserves, you know, equity in the workplace. Uh, and to be paid fairly and to be treated well in the workplace, to have health care. Right. We, we can agree on those common values, regardless of like what prior knowledge you have coming into to these conversations. And I think it's really cool that that y'all serve as that resource for folks, because, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a straight white guy like me, there's a lot that you just maybe don't know, uh, not because you don't want to know. But it's just it's not my experience. And so we, we only can go off our experiences, but that's where having relationships with diverse folks can really be so huge and we can learn from one another. So I think that's just it's fantastic that y'all are that resource for folks um, providing, you know, sample contract language and helping union leaders like wrap their heads around these issues that maybe aren't necessarily always on the front burner for them. Right. You know, a lot of union leaders are, are maybe experts in pensions, but maybe not how transphobia is affecting folks through legislation. So I think that's that's great that y'all are there. And something you talked about was Starbucks. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Starbucks because y'all have been, you know, pretty involved. You mentioned the kind of like the adopt a store, adopt a, a union uh, that y'all are doing, which I love that idea. Uh, but y'all y'all have been involved with Starbucks a little bit and, and Starbucks is is relevant, right? Because of the makeup of the workers at Starbucks, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I used to work at Starbucks. Um, and so I know firsthand that an overwhelming amount of Starbucks workers are LGBTQ. Um, it's, it's, you know, we sort of joke that we have a couple of token straight co-workers at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think Starbucks Workers United um, did a survey and found out that of the folks who have been leading the organizing in their stores, I think it was 63% of them 
are queer trans. Mm. So, I mean, that's huge given that, you know, we estimate about one to 2% of the population um, as a whole is trans and about 10% um, identify as queer. So 63% of the leaders organizing Starbucks are LGBTQ. Um, which that's is just crazy. phenomenal. And, yeah. yeah, that's, and it's not a coincidence by any means. Um, you know, I think when you're queer or trans, you sort of have to start questioning, um, authority a little more from very early on, um, just to survive. You have to sort of learn how to organize, how to stand in solidarity with other people. Um, so I think when we, get to an age where we start working and when we see anybody being treated unfairly we're more sensitive to that because we've experienced it um and so yeah all of that makes us like really natural union organizers um i think we've always been at the forefront we just haven't been quite as out and visible as the leaders um but there's a tremendous amount of queer labor history where we've been leading um, Absolutely. yeah. And, you know, our community faces huge disparities, whether it's in wage gaps, um, access to respectful, affordable health care, um, housing, you know, all so many different disparities. And a union contract is like the great equalizer, right? Like equal pay for equal work. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're, you know, low hanging fruit <laughs> for a bad pun um, for union organizing. And so Starbucks workers have run with this in a way that is just so exciting and inspiring. Um, you know, this is the type of giant progress company that has a reputation as progressive, which they're very much exposing that at the end of the day, corporations only care about profit um, and they only do like progressive things when they think it's in their interest for good PR. Um, so this weekend, Starbucks workers, uh, kicked off in Seattle at the, um, headquarters roastery for Starbucks, um, a strike wave across the country. So it's over 150 stores that are participating, which is over 3000, uh, union members. And, you know, at Pride at Work, we're mobilizing. And I know a lot of the labor movement is mobilizing to make sure we support folks showing up on those picket lines. Um, a lot of folks are also doing um, marches in Pride. Um, you know, this is the biggest weekend, I think, for Pride um, in the country. So, yeah, it's just it's very exciting to see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's definitely that overlap between uh, LGBT rights and workers rights and and. I think that's so cool what is happening with Starbucks and seeing this organizing drive. And uh, something you had mentioned to me uh, before this conversation is about the Seattle Pride Guide. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I thought that was an interesting story. Yeah. So the Seattle Starbucks workers um, who have unionized um, created this like beautiful, amazing ad. Um, if you just, you know, Google, you know, Starbucks Workers United Seattle, I think you can find it pretty easily. Um, just saying, asking Starbucks to come to the bargaining table to stop silencing queer and trans workers because, you know, Starbucks for years has held itself up as being such a queer friendly company, supposedly. And it's been standard practice for, I mean, years. I worked there over a decade ago when it was standard practice to decorate stores for Pride then. But now this year, they're making workers take down Pride flags and stuff, um, which is just like really, really sad because it's actually the baristas who create that sense of culture um, and make it have that community feel. And that's why customers go there, right? Um, there's the liberal trope of, you know, the latte drinking liberal for a reason. Um, but we're showing, you know, in Starbucks actions that it's not true. And so these workers, um, met the deadline and, uh, I think it was over 23 organizations, um, including Pride at Work and some international and local unions and, you know, the State Federation of Labor there. Um, all co-signed and sponsored to put this ad in the Seattle Pride Guide calling for Starbucks to bargain in good faith, to stop silencing their queer and trans workers um, and do right by them. And um, well, and, and I, I can just say that uh, 
they're doing that here in Alabama, which I mean, maybe Alabama is kind of the least surprising state that they would do this to workers at Starbucks. But we uh, we went to last week the Iron Workers uh, Southeastern Apprenticeship Competition, uh, where we saw uh, you know apprentices from across the South kind of compete, and uh, um, it was it was a, it was a lot of fun. And on the way back, we passed by the Scottsboro, Alabama Starbucks location, where workers uh, won their union election uh, probably almost a year ago now, and. And so we've got pretty strong ties to some of the people on that organizing committee. So since it was on the way back, we figured we'd stop by, get a coffee and see how they were doing. And, and they told us exactly the same thing that, that you're telling us here, that, uh, that you know, they had created some pride decorations um, and their management told them to take it down. Uh, so which and, and somehow Starbucks is, is out in the press saying that this isn't true, even though, you know, <laughs> workers at, at now hundreds of stores are saying that this this is true, but Starbucks is somehow denying it still. Right. They literally, the workers are taking videos and putting them on the internet <laughs> of their managers saying, making them take down the decorations. Like probably just the AI, evidence is really. there. That's, prob that's probably yeah. what it is. And, <laughs> yeah. And with this ad in Seattle, the Seattle Pride Guide opted not to um, publish it. Mm. Um, Starbucks is one wow. of the biggest sponsors of Seattle Pride. Wow. I mean, I think that you can connect the dots pretty well there, right? right? That like they don't want to piss off their corporate sponsor. So they decided not to publish an ad that was by queer and trans workers. That's horrifying. What is Pride even about? <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that kind of goes to like the the corporate like the corporatization of Pride. And we've seen that with Juneteenth as well. Just just recently where these corporations are jumping on it as an opportunity to, you know, wash their image or to make a profit, to, you know, tap into these markets of diverse uh, folks while at the same time totally like slapping a slap in the face in terms of the values of what it's really all about. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I had to ask you about that one because I, I just found that interesting, you know, the, the corporate connection of them being a sponsor. Um, and, you know, pride being used to launder their reputation um, of this viciously union busting company uh, that disproportionately has LGBT workers. It's uh, yeah, the hypocrisy is overwhelming there. Yeah, we see it in all kinds of different large corporations who love to throw money at pride across the country. Um, meanwhile, they are actively discriminating against their own LGBTQ workers. Yeah, Walmart is another one where for years now they've been sponsoring prides while at the same time being sued by their own workers um, over LGBTQ discrimination. So it's it's disingenuous. Um, you know, corporations are not actually for uh, queer and trans workers liberation at all. Right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so on the topic of like workplace discrimination, um, the Equality Act was just reintroduced in the Senate. And uh, could you talk to us a little bit about what that would do and, you know, why is that relevant for working people? Absolutely. Yeah. So the Equality Act was just reintroduced, as you said, um, this last week in the Senate. Um, and what it would do is codify into federal law um, non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ workers in a bunch of different areas, including employment. And I'll circle back to that one um, in a second, because that's really important and relevant to our conversation. Um, but also, you know, things like education, public accommodation. So, like, can you take the city bus sort of stuff? Um yeah, and um, credit, um, all kinds of different areas of life are covered. It's essentially updating um, civil rights legislation to make sure that it covers sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and, you know, in 2020, the Supreme Court um, did make a ruling um, that it is sex discrimination um, to discriminate against LGBTQ people um, in employment. But obviously, you know, it's been almost exactly a year since we saw the fall of Roe versus Wade. So we cannot trust this Supreme Court who we're learning about all kinds of corruption right now right. going on there um, to protect just like our well, now, basic rights. Brittany, you're say are you telling me that that they can't have friends? <laughs> Is that your position? 
I don't know about you, but I do not have friends spending that kind of money on me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe they're just friends, better friends. But... Maybe they're just better friends than your friends. Jacob, you haven't taken me out on a private plane yet. I'm just, well, I'm just letting you know. You haven't well, done that yet. We're so not as close. Be... We're not as close as as Thomas and Harlan Crow. I mean, Obviously. I have friends that I do that with, but it just happens to not be you. So. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll hit up Harlan. <laughs> We'll see if Harlan <laughs> is interested. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, your your point, though, the Supreme Court is not a friend to working people at all. We cannot rely on courts. Uh, and so, you know, getting these protections in law would be huge, especially in a place like Alabama, where, frankly, you know, it seems like an uphill battle to even consider the possibility that these protections could be enacted by like our state legislature, right? It, it, I think, and and that's where it's, you know, particularly relevant to folks in the South. Um, we're, we need federal, we need federal help as, as we often do. Uh, we need federal help to ensure people's rights are respected. Yeah. And especially at this time in 2023, there were over 525 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced mm. in 41 different states. Mm. Wow. And so far, I think I'm a little behind on my count here, but there are at least 75 that have been signed into law, um, which is really scary. So we're actually moving backwards in terms of LGBTQ rights in the United States right now. And to be clear, I think it's a backlash to the progress that we have made but it is deeply impacting people. Um, I mean, people are actively losing the health care that is life saving for them. Um, there are studies that have shown that for transgender and non-binary youth, just having access to gender affirming health care reduces suicide risk by 73 mm. percent. Right. I mean, that is just huge. Um, you know, like one fifth of gay, lesbian or bisexual high school students attempted suicide in the last year. Think about that for a second. One fifth in just in the last year. Like that is the impact that these bills are having. It is literally killing people. So it is very serious. And these are our coworkers. These are our neighbors, even if we don't know it. These are our coworkers' kids. And so not only do we need these protections at the state and federal level, but a union contract offers unique protections. It is the gold standard because it doesn't matter what the law is. You can bargain and you can win for protections. And then you also, if you're organized, have the solidarity of your coworkers right there immediately you know we do want federal protections but going through the eeoc to file a discrimination complaint is a multi-year process you have to hire a lawyer all right. of these things it is not pleasant if, yeah and but if you're a union member oh my gosh you have immediate access to a steward or rep you have contract language that protects you that can be remedied right then and there um, and your union dues have already paid for it. <laughs> um, it's just, it's amazing. I, you know, I've worked um, in places where I've been in the closet. I've worked in places where I've been out and it's been frowned upon. Um, and I've worked in union shops where I've been out. And it is just a world of a difference. Even just every day, knowing that that contract language is there and that my coworkers have my back. I mean, it's a game changer. Right, right. And, I, and it kind of is reminiscent of the conversation we were having earlier with those brothers from the machinist union about due process and how it does provide freedom. I mean, there is a sense of freedom when you can go to work and be yourself and know that as long as you're doing your job, right, you, you have protections against the arbitrary whims of some manager, uh, you know, who may or may not be a bigot, uh, you know, and that's something that's just that's so important for working people to have, to have protections on the job. Uh, and I agree with you that, you know, as much as we need the legislation and we're going to all fight for this legislation, we can we can make progress without we don't have to wait on Washington. We can make progress in every shop with every union contract. And so I wanted to end there. If you could tell us kind of do you have some like a, a parting message maybe to, to union activists and particularly union leaders who maybe don't 
fully understand these issues or, or don't fully understand why this is relevant to them and their membership. What would you say to those folks? Yeah, absolutely. So if you have more than 10 workers in your shop, statistically, you have somebody who's part of the LGBTQ community, whether you know it or not. Um, and we know that the boss's favorite tactic is always to divide us and distract us any way they can so that we're busy fighting with each other instead of fighting and using our collective power to win better wages and protections for everybody. So, um, yeah, so it's, yeah, just, it's, it's, it's just a boss tactic. And so even if you don't agree with it, you don't understand LGBTQ people, um, it's in your own interest. Um, and it strengthens your collective bargaining power um, to stand in solidarity and, you know, stick to those principles of the labor movement that every single worker, without exception, deserves respect and safety and affordable health care. Um, you know, like you said earlier, an injury to one is an injury to all. And so we're here as a resource. We, you know, you don't have to know how to say the right thing. We're not going to judge you for that. We're just thrilled that you are calling and reaching out to us. Um, you can always find us at prideatwork.org. We have phenomenal staff. As leaders, we take a lot of these calls too. And so, um, yeah, we're here as a resource because we want to fight for the entire labor movement and the entire working class. Awesome. Awesome. And and remind us again, where can folks find you all to get plugged in? Yeah, so prideatwork.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter for the moment. We may not stay there forever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, understood. Understood. Well, uh, Brittany, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing on behalf of the movement. And uh, yeah, I really, really encourage folks to follow Pride at Work and, and follow what they're doing and use this resource that we have available for our unions. Uh, Y'all are doing great work. So keep it up. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, brothers. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Enjoyed it. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 